Okay, so this week we are starting to talk about digital forensic science. And before we can actually start with digital forensic investigations, we have to understand what is a digital forensic investigation and how is it different than other types of investigations. So first off, we define digital investigation, a digital investigation as a process to answer questions about digital states and events. So what does that mean? Think about you using your computer right now. Um, you might want to search for a file on your computer. Well, you want to understand how is that file on your computer, where is it at, how can you get the data, right? So you can start a digital investigation on your computer just by looking for a file. Um, you're trying to figure out the state of the data stored on your computer. Well, that's a little bit different than what investigators do whenever they're doing a digital forensic investigation. More than just accessing the data directly or searching the data directly, we have to use special procedures to make sure that our results are always correct. Whereas if you can't find your file, the data may still be there, but it's just a little bit harder to, to access. So a digital forensic investigation is a, spe a special case of digital investigation where we use procedures and techniques that allow the evidence to be accepted in court. And that means that the standards that court have to accept the data um, as evidence um, need to be a little bit more reliable than a search function on your computer that finds a file. We have to make sure that that search function is correct all of the time and is resulting in the data that we expect. So a digital forensic investigation is formally defined as the collection, preservation, analysis, and presentation of computer-related evidence uh, for a court of law. Everything we're doing in digital forensic investigations is specifically for court. Whereas if you're trying to find a file on your computer, you're not going to be submitting that file to court probably, right? Um, you're just interested in your own files. But court has a much higher standard. So whenever we're talking about criminal investigations, digital forensic investigations, we're always talking about court. Anytime you hear the word forensic, we're basically using procedures and processes that can be accepted in a court of law. So all procedures and techniques must be what we call forensically sound to be considered to be admissible in court. So we are submitting into court digital evidence. And you might have heard about evidence, for example, a bloody knife if somebody was attacking somebody else. But what is digital evidence and how is it different? Digital evidence is any data that supports or refutes a hypothesis that was formulated during an investigation. And we'll talk about what a hypothesis is in an investigation in the next lecture, but for now, just think about it as something that supports or denies a claim, okay? So digital evidence is a little bit different than traditional evidence in the fact that we can't touch it directly. So for example, the knife, we can touch a knife, we can touch, um, any type of traditional evidence that would normally be submitted physically to court, but data we can't touch. So digital evidence must be translated into human readable form. The fact that we can't touch it means we can't observe it directly. We have to go through this translation process first. So think of it kind of like languages. Um, we have data that's in a certain form, and before we can make sense of it, it has to be converted into another form that humans can actually uh, read and interact with and understand. So each layer of abstraction can introduce information loss. So in computers, uh, whenever we're investigating computers, we're starting at um, basically the physical layer, which is more or less electronic signals or um, magnetic uh, fields and we're converting that into ones and zeros. We're converting those ones and zeros into um, some type of data structure, and then we make sense of that data structure um, to figure out what the data is actually telling us, what information does this data contain. So whenever we're going through that abstraction process, this conversion or translation process, we might lose some information or we might translate it a little bit incorrectly. And lots of programs translate information incorrectly a lot of the time. But in digital investigations, because the requirements of court are so high, we have to make sure that we are minimizing the amount of mistakes that this translation process introduces. 
Think about traditional evidence again, the knife. If, if anyone looks at a bloody knife, everyone can understand what that is. But with data, because we have to go through this translation process, it's not immediately clear what information that data contains until we translate it, and even then it's a little bit vague sometimes. So the point of this is that we have to test our tools to make sure that we're not translating data incorrectly or improperly. We have to do what's called data or um, evidence validation. A lot of validation needs to take place during your investigation. Whenever you're dealing with data, can you get the same information using multiple tools? Can everyone kind of agree on that particular translation of the information? So we have to do a lot of result validation during our investigations. Digital evidence, just like traditional evidence, is also subject to changes that um, might be uh, destructive but are not necessarily malicious. So for example, evidence dynamics. We call this evidence dynamics and this applies also to traditional evidence. So evidence dynamics is any influence that changes evidence regardless of intent. So think about, um, again, our knife. If somebody stabs someone else and drops the knife and it rains, the rain is actually washing away evidence, but the rain didn't intend to wash away the evidence. So this applies to digital evidence too. If we do a crime and some evidence is created on the computer, other processes that are already taking place on that system might overwrite or change or delete or somehow modify the digital evidence that we would rely on. Some of those might be malicious. For example, a hacker might be trying to cover their tracks, but many of them are non-malicious. So if someone was uh, hacked or their computer was taken over, Digital evidence might be created on the system, but if the, the user, the person, doesn't know that they were attacked, they might inadvertently overwrite some, some traces or some evidence on that computer without knowing it. They didn't intend to delete the evidence, but through, not, through normal processes, normally using the computer, they lost some information. So a lot of causes for evidence dynamics in digital investigations is, um, first off, from system administrators. A lot of servers get hacked actually quite often. So system administrators, their job is to fix things, right? So they are sometimes interested, they want to do investigations and find out who actually hacked into their, their system, but they're more interested in fixing the system and get it running again. System administrators are uh, more interested in making sure that the systems that were attacked um, are up and running. So sometimes that means that whenever they're attempting to get those systems running again, they overwrite some evidence that might be on those systems. Um, another is offenders covering behavior. So again, hackers getting into the system or viruses um, changing things in the system to try to hide themselves. Um, the changes might actually be malicious. Um, obviously hackers and viruses don't want to get caught, so they might delete some traces that they've created to make sure that nobody can detect them. Uh, victim actions. The users of the computers themselves, like I said, don't normally know that they've been attacked or that their systems have been compromised, so they continue to surf the internet, install new programs, whatever they normally do, and those actions may also overwrite some data on the computer. Secondary transfer. All computers, not all, most computers now are interacting with other devices. So secondary transfer, if your phone was attacked and you plug that into your computer, then some evidence for um, that attack might be downloaded to your computer or the communication between your phone and your computer might overwrite some traces. Um, if your computer is connecting to an external server like um, Dropbox or something like that, some changes in Dropbox might be copied over. So computers now are always talking to other computers online. online. Um, so the result is that there's a lot of transfer between one computer and another, not only syncing files, but just those computers communicating over the network. So secondary transfer can cause a lot of data to be overwritten inadvertently. Uh, witnesses themselves, um, 
I've worked on some cases where witnesses saw something illegal on someone's computer. They wanted to, and they did, report the case to the police, but they knew that that material was bad and they didn't want anyone else to see it, so they deleted it. They had all of, they had good intentions. They didn't want to actually, or they didn't realize they were removing evidence, but they removed evidence because they wanted to protect other people. So sometimes witnesses intervene in digital systems and can remove uh, digital evidence as well. So it's best if you know something is on a system, just leave it on there and, and call the police or in this case, do your, do your investigation. Uh, and nature and weather. Of course, nature and weather um, affect a lot of systems and computers especially don't like getting wet. So if you've ever had a computer hard drive or even a computer get hit by electric uh, lightning or um, was in a flood, anything like that, you're most likely going to lose data. Obviously, the weather did not intend to change any digital evidence, but nature and weather can remove or modify digital evidence. So those are just some examples of the way that data normally changes in systems. It might not always be malicious, and many times it's not done maliciously. It's just the way that computers work. So for admissibility or getting that digital evidence accepted in court, um, every country, we've already talked a little bit about multiple um, countries or international cases for cybercrime. Every country has a little bit different standards uh, for accepting digital evidence in court. So for many jurisdictions, um, evidence must be at least two things. We say relevant to the case or to the claim that's being made. So a criminal or a suspect, um, suspected criminal um, has some charge laid against them. Is this digital evidence relevant to the case that we're actually looking at? In many cases, whenever we're investigating someone, um, if we find evidence of one type of crime, we might find evidence of other types of crime as well. But then we have to look at what is the charge, what is the claim that we're actually investigating here. Um, it's not always, uh, or we're not always investigating every single crime that we see. We might, we have to focus on whatever the charge is being laid. So is the digital evidence relevant to the charge that we're actually investigating? And is the digital evidence reliable? And this is where the distinction between digital investigation and digital forensic investigation comes into play. A digital investigation is less reliable. We're using other procedures that we don't necessarily need to check, um, or we don't need to check as thoroughly. Digital forensic investigation, we are using procedures and techniques that are uh, reliable, reproducible, other people can verify our findings and make sure that they're correct. So for admissibility, evidence must be relevant and reliable in most jurisdictions. But this all depends, of course, on the cor court's decisions. Judges ultimately have um, their power to accept or deny evidence, depending on what they think and what they feel about the case and the charge being made. So even if evidence meets all of the criteria laid out in a jurisdiction, the court may still decide to admit it or not. And this is up to the discretion of the judge. All an investigator, which is what we are now, can do is ensure that the evidence has been derived in a forensically sound manner that we've actually used the tools and techniques that are tested and verified and reproducible to make sure we're always getting the best digital evidence out of our investigation. So I've said, I've talked a little bit about forensic soundness or what is forensically sound. So forensically sound, just a definition, the application of a transparent digital forensic process that preserves the original meaning of the data um, for production in a court of law. Now think about, we were talking about translation of information or going from low level data to actually human understandable information. So if something is forensically sound, it's a process that uh, preserves the original meaning of the data, right? So we can verify that these ones and zeros actually represent this particular piece of information. Once we do the translation, the translation always results in the information that we expect to find. And other investigators, 
third-party investigators can also find the same information from the same data. I mean, the whole point is that if somebody questions our results, we can give them all of our data, they can find exactly the same, they can come to exactly the same conclusions as us from the evidence that's been presented. So derived evidence should be reliable, complete, accurate, and able to be tested and verified. So reliable, again, can you actually trust the information that's being presented by this data? Or once you can translate this data, can you actually trust what this information says? Is it complete? Uh, for example, think about context. If you found um, an image that looks like it might be a bad image and you only see it by itself, then you might conclude that something bad has happened. But if you see it with a bunch of other images, maybe the thing that it was related to isn't bad. So context really matters here. We have to look at where the data is located, what data is associated with it, what actions were associated with it. Um, do we have a complete picture of what actually happened on the system? Uh, is the data accurate? So whenever we were copying or um, analyzing the data, did we have accurate representations of this information? Did we copy it completely and exactly the way that it was um, originally intended to be? And with, with digital evidence, making sure something is accurate is a little bit easier. We'll talk about that later. And finally, able to be tested and verified. So this is the big one. Once we've copied data correctly and we've analyzed or converted the data into information, can any other investigator follow the procedures and processes we used to come to the same conclusion? We should be able to give our um, case, essentially, to any other investigator, and they should be able to verify our findings. And this is the core part. Um, this is essentially auditing to make sure that anyone else can follow what we've done and come to the same conclusions. If they can, then that means our process was um, more trustable than if they couldn't. So in the US and a couple other countries have kind of followed this standard as well. Um, there was a ruling called uh, Daubert or essentially the Daubert standard. There's four categories for assessing the reliability of a procedure for deriving evidence. And this is for any type of evidence, not only digital evidence, but this is the way that judges tend to decide whether they accept evidence into court or not. So first off is testing. Uh, can and has the procedure that we're using to extract the information from the computer been tested? If you're using a procedure that hasn't been tested, how can you trust it, right? So has the procedure that you're using been tested? Who all is testing it? How was it tested? Um, the judges, the courts will assess whether that testing is appropriate and your method actually seems to work. Uh, error rate. Is there a known error rate for your procedure? So we talked a little bit in translation that sometimes some things uh, fail a little bit. We need to know how often those things fail because if we're trying to derive trustable evidence, um, what is the probability that our results might be wrong? Okay. Uh, next is publication. Uh, has the procedure actually been published? This kind of goes back to testing. If it's been published, that means that other people have tested it and come to some conclusion. And then acceptance. What's the procedure or is the procedure generally accepted by the community? So in our case, law enforcement, corporate investigators, courts, um, do they actually accept or generally accept what we're trying to do in this case? Uh, and finally, chain of custody. So chain of custody is very important for proving to court that we've taken all procedures necessary to make sure that our ev evidence is uh, reliable and no one has modified it or tampered with it. So chain of custody is an unbroken audit trail of seized exhibits to determine what was done, when, and by whom. Chain of custody is exactly the same as for traditional evidence, except with digital evidence, it's easier to manipulate evidence, um, uh, basically changing the information that the data um, tells us about the case. So um, it's a little bit more difficult with traditional evidence to modify something without someone knowing. So with digital evidence, anyone essentially can come in and modify things. So we have to protect um, the digital evidence, and we'll talk about how we actually do that protection 
in a little bit. But chain of custody is basically, basically making sure we always know where the data is, who has access to it, and what were they doing with it whenever they did have access to it. So that's it for this lecture. Um, next time we'll talk about the actual investigation process. Thank you.